so welcome. Welcome again to Pinhole Quilting at our Pershaw showroom in what is today very rainy, very, very windy weather. I look forward to seeing some of your comments and things. I hope we've got a really interesting session for you today. It's applicable to sit down, stand up, movable, stationary, and some of the points are also applicable to domestic quilters as well. So let's have a look at what we've ha what's happened in the past week. And we're just checking. Yeah, Pete's giving me a thumbs up. That's always a good sign. Um, if he was doing the thumbs down, I'm not sure what the, uh, whether that would be a terminal situation or whether it'd just be temporary, but I think we're good to go. Now, in the last week, we've had, as always, here at Pinhole Quilting, um, a very busy week. And it's been a lovely week where I got out to do some, um, an installation uh, with a lady uh, on her Sweet 16 with the, with the new Insight table. And in a bit, I'm going to be doing some quilting on the Capri with the Insight table. And for those of you who, who don't know about the, the Insight table, um, it's a really interesting innovation that came out with the Capri, but is now available for Sweet 16s. And those people who've got a Sweet 16 already, they can upgrade it and it gives you stitch regulation within the table. It's got two sensors and it's sensing how fast you're moving the fabric. And as a result, the, mean, the machine goes faster or slower, depending. So anyway, I go over to um, this customer. We were delayed actually from last week because there was so much snow, of course. Um, anyway, not too far away, uh, which is why I was doing it. And uh, it was such a lovely installation. And I, um, I really, really enjoyed um, meeting uh, Greta. We put her on the email newsletter we sent out yesterday. And one of the reasons that we enjoyed it is I suppose that we've, we've kind of both been quilting for quite a long time. And Greta has been quilting for, I think, over 30 years. And there was so much history in her studio, her studio. We had a one meter square area to slot the machine into, which was just perfect. So you don't need a huge amount of space for a sit down long arm for a stationary machine and what was lovely was that uh oh i was going to say good morning to a few people i can see some people popping up on here that i know which is lovely so susie saying good morning from dorset hi susie hi to your husband as well who is so interesting um with all the things he does and helen good news for you helen I'm gonna tell you in a second good news and janice and hello to pam Oh yes, hi Pam in Surbiton, how nice to hear from you, Carol. Oh, Rosemary over in Suffolk and, oh, Barbara, yes. I dropped off a parcel from Barbara um, when I was en route uh, to my installation for the Sweet 16. And uh, we, we, we sort of, I was halfway down her drive talking to her. I think she had everything. Anyway, hello, Barbara, it was lovely to meet you. And hopefully we'll see you down here. And how nice to see both Leanne and Marie, Suzanne uh, down in Bath, very wet. And good morning to Lynn. And uh, I've just emailed you, Lynn. So just before we came live. And good morning, Carol. Gosh, there's so many people that we know, and it's just lovely to have you. Um, it, it, Pete and I are really looking forward to these sessions. Every week we kind of go, oh, that's Saturday live. And, you know, what are we going to talk about? And all that kind of thing. And, you know, there's never, there's never a lack of things to talk about. Anyway, I was with uh, Greta and we were going back through our history of the classes that we'd done in the past. And it turned out that we think we were both on the same Harriet Hargrave who used to do the machine quilting teaching uh, for Christine Porter with her Cabot conferences. And we think we were on the same workshop in 1999. Um, she did some lectures and some workshops. And I remember being really a bit overwhelmed. It was my first machine quilting uh, exploration and it was with the person who, who taught machine quilting sort of worldwide. Harriet Hargrave was, was absolute master of, of um, machine quilting and wrote, it's a book I've still got, machine, Heirloom Machine Quilting. It's a fantastic book if ever you get a chance to get a copy of it. Anyway, we're on the same, same class and you know, we just had a lovely chat about things. And I'll be posting some photos on um, Facebook of some of the quilts that she's got because she's got some fantastic quilts uh, by Linda Straw, who some of you might know from uh, the past of being a really uh, accomplished uh, quilter slash embroiderer. Uh, she sort of fell between both 
both skills. And so um, it was quite an unusual, very um, innovative style of quilting that Linda Straw did. At the same time that um, Pauline Burbage was really sort of um, very popular as well. And Linda Straw is in various quilt collections around the world, um, including I believe she's got a quilt in the Chicago um, Art Museum. So she, um, she's got a Linda Straw quilt. So this is fantastic. Anyway, she was very generous. We had, um, she keeps chickens. So she gave me this lovely gift of some eggs and Pete and I have had those poached on toast on Pete's homemade sourdough, which was absolutely beautiful. Um, and I do, I do love to make um, poached eggs, so. Yes, well, I don't know if you're listening, Greta, but Liz did your poached eggs justice because Liz was taught how to poach eggs by none other than the master of the poached egg, Raymond Blanc himself. That's we went true. on a course at Raymond's fabulous uh, Michelin starred restaurant yep. about a decade ago. And Liz got her poached eggs tasted by Raymond himself. I did. Having I taught did. Her. <laughs> I, I have to say that um, it's one of those moments that will go down in my sort of culinary experiences at absolute the pinnacle because to have Raymond Blanc eat my poached egg, which I'd done with a little compote of tomatoes, cherry tomatoes with herbs um, and uh, olive oil, and to have the expression on his face as he ate these beautifully poached eggs, so they're very, very fresh, just like yours were, Greta, and the expression was just a joy as he ate it, and I will never have that image go out of my mind when I cook poached eggs. So anyway, just want to say thank you very much for that, and also thank you to Pete for the sourdough bread, which he makes on a regular basis and makes life so much better. So good morning to Leslie, good morning to Lindsay over in Switzerland, and good morning to Pearl just up the road um, in Redditch, which is lovely. And it's great to see so many people saying good morning. Oh, and Jenny, the quilting lady from Lancashire. And uh, I love seeing your posts, Jenny, because you post some great posts of the Pro Stitcher, and you're doing some amazing work. So congratulations on on that business that you're you're doing up in Lancashire. And to Lynn, Lynn Jones, and Sally up in Scotland, and Jackie in Wellingborough, <laughs> amazing. Oh, and Sylvia's on here as well as long as well as uh, Zoe. Sylvia and I have had a few conversations this week, but I think you're sorted now, Sylvia. So that's good. Um, okay, and Janet, Janet has just recently moved in. This is a really good thing actually because. What we're finding is we've got a lot more of a cohort of quilters um, for some reason around us in Worcestershire. So we've got um, various quilters. I think, gosh, when we open up, it's just gonna be a joy to have people back here in our showroom. And good morning, Stephen. And oh yes, Harriet Hargrave started me on my machine quilting journey, says Leanne. That's interesting. Um, I think Harriet was absolutely key. Interesting story. Back in the late 80s, early 90s, I think it was, Harriet went over to Switzerland because she was a very big banana dealer. At one point, Harriet, I think, was selling more bananas than anybody else in the States in her lovely shop in Golden in Colorado, which I was lucky enough to visit. I have some friends just down the road in Denver. And uh, so I went to see Harriet and her daughter. We were having a chat about machine quilting. Um, and Harriet was saying how frustrating it was just having this little space and that she'd spoken to the top man at Benina and said to him, you really need to have like a longer arm machine. You know, she was giving him the heads up that actually in her skill set of her and her teaching experience, this is what she thought that Benina needed to do. And they didn't, they didn't listen for a long, long time. So, hey, there you go. That's one of the interesting stories. I think um, about Harriet, that she was such a great exponent of machine quilting. Hi Liz, hi Sally. Right, for those people who, who have been waiting so patiently, so, so, so patiently, we are delighted to tell you that over the, what's it, the Atlantic, we're gonna call it the pond. Over the pond, last night flew the Moxies. Yes! All we, those of you waiting for your moxies, the moxies are in Heathrow and they will be with us early next week, Monday, we hope. Yep, moxie has landed. Now this is another sold out shipment. So um, everybody that we've told that we've got a machine for them, this is your shipment. 
and we are taking more um, orders now for our next shipment, um, which is already starting to sell out. So the Moxie has been an amazingly successful machine, and it really does hit that sort of lovely price point as well for people who haven't yet got onto the long arm learning journey. So Moxie's here. Also, we've got, I'm looking over to the board here because it's got some prompts for me. I'm not just sort of zoning out. Um, We've also got the insight table upgrades for those people who've got Sweet 16s that are upgrading and some of the X-Demo machines that we, we sold. We've got some of the insight tables coming for those. Ooh, and some of our some Moxie customers have suddenly come to life. <laughs> We've made them happy this morning. That's they were good. really down. It's like, I really want my Moxie. I'm in just, lockdown. I want my Moxie. Just to explain. Oh, you've been so patient. We do appreciate it. Combination of COVID and the terrible weather in yeah. the States meant that our shipment got stuck in southern USA somewhere for a couple of weeks at least. Oh, a little bit longer. And, you know, Pete and I, I mean, Pete's been involved in distribution and stuff for a long time. And, you know, I started working at Cotton Patch back in 94 and we used to bring over consolidations all the time from the States. And in that whole period since 94, I have never experienced such a problem as we just had bringing that delivery in. Um, and our shipper said it's the worst experience that they've ever had of, of, a, of an airline. So, you know, thank you for bearing with us. We are so excited um, and we'll do it. We will get some photos to show you that those moxes have landed. It's going to be great. So hello to Glenis and Anne and Chris Hillier and old Claire down at Ives, Denise, Susan Such over in uh, Sussex. Brilliant. And Harmony Quilting. Hi. Jennifer, good to, oh, good to hear from you. And Kate, oh, hi, Kate. One of our newest Amara customers. Um, Kate, we were so delighted that you've, uh, you've got your Amara there and you're doing some beautiful work on it. Um, and Val Brooks, who's just finished some amazing quilts that she's been doing um, of the, oh, okay. May, this is like a memory blank. You know, um, who does those amazing quilts? Okay, forgotten. You have to post it, Belle. What's the name of her? I've forgotten. Terrible. Um, senior moment. Okay, now, that's, that's all of our catching up. We are so happy about the Moxies, but we're going to move on and tell you about some of the other things we're going to cover today. So the idea of this session is, as much as anything, it's about connecting with you. You know, we're all in lockdown. We can't do anything else except go out for our one exercise a day. Um, obviously, you know, we're, we're doing a little bit, not much. Um, we sort of restricting our installations to the absolute minimum. But what I would like to discuss with you is, and I'm just going to put this over here. Jacqueline is, de Jong. Oh, Jacqueline de Jong. Thank sorry. you, Lorraine. Sorry, Thank Jacqueline. Thank you for the heads up. Sorry, Jacqueline. Thank you. Yeah, so Val Brooks has just finished a fantastic Jacqueline de Jong and um, I know that Linda Jackson, um, our handy quilter ambassador, very often quilts her samples and does an amazing job on those as well. Let's talk about needles. Needles are so important. You know, this builds up for, on from last week when we were talking about various things to do with the bobbin. Bobbin is the foundation of our tension. Needle, very, very important. Obviously, if it's not working properly and people who've got domestic machines will find the same thing, um, you know, if a burr on the needle, you can see, you can actually hear, quite often you can hear when a needle is getting blunt. It'll have that sort of almost noise, like a, it's, it's having a struggle getting through the fabric, basically. Um, and you can either put in a new needle for every project, which is what Handy Quilt to say. Uh, here at the showroom, we don't know how many stitches our machines have done or what they've been through and they might have been sort of taken somewhere and used at a show. So, well, not recently, but in the past they would have been. And so it's not easy for us to keep an eye on it. So we change them when we need to. And you can tell when a needle needs changing. Um, and if you've got really bad eyesight like me, you can actually sometimes see that a needle is blunt as well as feel it. The other thing that I wanted to discuss with you, and there's some information on our blog post about this. There's, the three there's a photo of three needles. Most of the time, you'll be using a sharps needle. So a sharps needle, it pierces through the fabric, just goes straight through. The idea being, and the reason for this is because by having a sharps needle that pierces through and doesn't get deflected, it creates a much straighter and better stitch. So that's the reason. Now, 
We're moving the machine in all kinds of which way and stuff and at very, very high speeds. I mean, on our fastest machine, the one we've got over there, the Infinity, we're talking 3,100 stitches per minute. That's quick, that is quick. And I have run the machine at that speed with Pro Stitcher. So it's gotta be accurate. You need strong needles. So these machines use industrial needles. They do not use domestic needles because there is a limit to how much stress can be put on a domestic needle. So the industrial type of needle has a round shank. And the round shank gives it, well, it's a stronger, more has more integrity to it because it hasn't had that flattened shank. But also, they're slightly thicker. What we then size a needle that we would typically use, if you look at something like the Superior Threads reference chart, you'll see domestic needle use this, and um, long arm needle use this, and you'll see it's a normally a couple of sizes more. Now, most of you who come from a domestic sewing background go, well, that's a big needle. Why would I need such a big needle? But we still, what we're doing is we're matching the thread to the needle. So one of the first steps we do when we select our project is we look at our project, we work out what we're gonna do quilting wise. And once we've chosen our threads, which might be based on the kind of effect we want, whether we want it to blend, whether we want it to stand out, thicker thread, it'll stand out more, finer thread, great for micro quilting, etc. What we're trying to do is match the thread to the needle. The long groove that runs down the front of the machine, that runs down the front of the needle, and points towards you when you're standing or sitting at the machine, that long groove has to take the thread. For every time a stitch is formed, that thread would have gone through the eye and around the hook, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say upwards of 30 times. Pete's nodding, so I'm not very good on numbers, but. Yes, don't know exactly. It depends on the thread itself as well, I think. Yeah, but possibly. Yes, oh, and the stitch I think most people don't recognize that fact that the thread goes backwards <clears throat> and forwards through the eye of the needle so many times yep. at the same point, which is why if you mismatch your needle and your thread, you get shredding of your thread. Yes, thank you, Pete. And that's a really, really important thing for you to know. So because if that groove is too small and it gets shredding, or even if it's too big, you think, okay, well, I'll just go bigger. Well, of course, that's not gonna look good on a project where it looks like you've sort of hole punched your quilt and the, the thread is sitting somewhere in the hole. Now you need for each hole that you've got, and when the quilt is relaxed, it will look less like it's been sewn. You want that thread to fill the hole. That's what you're trying to do. That's the aim without shredding. So we have a chart um, on our website and it's on the handouts that we give you when you get your machine. You should have a TNT sheet like this. This is also on our infographics on our website and I've put it on the latest blog post too. So at the bottom of the latest blog post after all the gorgeous Glide Thread Club facts that I'm gonna come on to in a moment, this thread chart shows you, for example, 60 weight, 50 weight, 40 weight, say polyester or cotton, um, you'd use a 16 needle. So typically, I mean, something like this, this is Glide, this is Glide 40 weight, we would start with a 16 needle. We would see how that sewed, and if we were happy with it, happy days. And if we're not, we, if it was shredding, we'd go to an 18. Uh, Glide comes in also uh, the variegated uh, thread. And the variegated thread tends to need an 18, not a 16. I don't know why, but that's the case. With Glide 60, I would use, and I can look at my chart here, I could try and go down to a 14. I'd prefer to go to a 14. It's a small hole, uh, it looks a little bit more elegant, and depending on what I'm quilting through, so say I'm not doing many layers, so it's not a foundation piece quilt, then I'd go to 14. If it had lots of applique, maybe lots of steamer seam two or bonder web applique stuff that I'm quilting over, or say it got lots of foundation piecing, then I might go to a 16 with my Glide 60. So Glide 60 is the same sort of thread as Glide 40, but it's just finer. And I'm gonna do a little demo in a moment on that. So our needles 
then. Mostly it's sharps and we do packs, mix packs. We've got 12s and 14s, 16s and 18s. And these are actually less expensive than a domestic needle. We also do the full range of 12 to 20. And just to explain that when we, when we time the machines, these handy quilter machines are timed, and I say timed, I'm not going to go into the technical details, but let's say they're set up to work with a 16 needle. So that's our midpoint. And then we can add eight, we can go to 18 or 20 or even 21, and we can go down to 14 or 12. So it's set up for a 16, and then that means it, you know, happy days, it's all working beautifully for the other sizes as well. The other thing is that some people, uh, when they get their machine, they might have an Infinity or a Forte, and those machines, certainly the Infinity, is shipped with high speed needles. Now these have the same impact in terms of it's an R, like a Sharps type needle. So for that purpose, it's a, it's a Sharps, but it has what's called a bent crank. Okay, so your bent crank, and the reason why it's a bent crank is to enable it to have, um, it's more robust for having more deflection. And it means that even when it has deflection, the needle is presented to the hook to deliver the loop of the thread more accurately and consistently so you get less skip stitches. Anybody who's got a handy quilter machine can use high speed needles. So if you are a very fast quilter and you are getting skip stitches, I mean, that might be a thing to do. I'd love to get some feedback from you on that as to whether anybody has done that, but that is the theory of it. And it is a sharps point, it says that on there. So high speed needles. Anybody who's got those um, more powerful machines, very, very fast machines like the Infinity, then uh, you'll wanna replace them with high speed needles. Now, the other type of needle is a lot of discussion. We've seen a lot of discussion and it's fantastic because discussion means that people discuss hopefully by having educated information. And we have an alternative to the shops, which is the ballpoint. And the ballpoint needle is generally for knit fabrics. Okay, now what's a knit? For those of you who are uh, dressmakers, you'll know that a knit means things like jersey. It also means things like, for us, for t-shirt quilts. Um, so anything where the, the, the machining of the fabric involves like a knitting process that if you were to cut it, it would start to fall apart, then you need a ballpoint. And what that does is, is it forces the fibers apart. And in doing so, it doesn't break the thread and you don't get these holes that can kind of look very ugly. So that's where you traditionally would use a ballpoint. I say traditionally because we do have some customers who are using the ballpoint for more generic quilting. And certainly in the States, there's a lady called Kelly Klein. She came over to do our Handy Quilter Academy in 2018. And Kelly really recommends the Schmetz light ballpoint. They are different to the Gross Beckett medium ballpoint. Now we've, I don't think we've got many of these um, Gross Beckett ones left because we're, our preference is the light ballpoint. And Kelly used those for her vintage pieces. Kelly Klein, vintage quilting. There's a Facebook group. Um, and if for anybody who's interested in seeing how Kelly takes some of her beautiful acquisitions from the thrift stores and from eBay, etc. then you'll see that Kelly uses these. And we've got those. We've got them in mix and we've got 16s and 18s. So. Okay, question from Sue, which is a common question when it comes to needles, is yep. which is the best to use for batiks? That is a really common question. So should we discuss what the issues are with batiks first? Now, Batiks vary in quality. You'll know, most people will know, that batiks are made using a process of uh, wax that's applied to the fabric, um, and then different dyes are applied, and the bits where the wax is doesn't attract the dye. So you get these fantastic um, uh, fabrics. And I was lucky enough, when I was traveling um, many years ago, I went to Bali and went to Kuta, where they make a lot of the batik fabrics. Um, and I bought some um, absolutely, oh, 
beautiful sarong that I had um, made of uh, antique batik, which was absolutely gorgeous. So yeah, batik fabric, the, d the difficulty is, is that we're very used to cotton fabrics where over the years we've gone from surface dye, traditionally the sort of little ditzy chint, uh, cotton prints would be surface dye printed. And then we moved on to um, more chemical sort of, that's like the Procyon dyes. I'm not an expert on dyes, but that's, as I understand it, is actually absorbed by the fabric rather than filling the gaps between the cotton fabric. And every time that you've got a, a surface dye, it has the potential to slow the needle going through the fabric. And any resistance from the wax residues and various other things will cause a problem. So that's partly why, but also it's the weave. So traditional cotton fabrics are what's called a 60 or a 72 thread count. Um, now, we've, there was somebody called Deirdre McElroy who used to do a lot of hand quilting, and she used to have a little device that would tell you how, what your thread count was. It was pretty useful, actually, if you were a hand quilter. Um, and it, was, it had like this fine mesh, and you could actually count, should you so wish, what your thread count was. But 72 is typical, and that's a good weave. But as soon as you start getting into uh, batiks, which look better and absorb the dye, much more effectively if they're a denser weave, then you've got a problem because our sharps needle is trying to break all those fibers. That delay can then cause a problem for the loop lift, which is when the needle goes down, when it comes up 2.2 millimeters on most of our machines, it forms a loop. If it doesn't form that loop, you get a skip stitch. So sometimes what people end up doing is going to a bigger needle, but it depends. It does depend. That was a I quick mean, answer. <laughs> that was the quick answer. Liz knows far too much about this stuff, so she could talk for too long. In, in essence, some people actually find that batiks work perfectly well with a standard sharps needle. Other people say uh, a ballpoint is better, but it depends. Um, it depends really about the fabric, because one batik isn't the same as another batik, so really it's a question of, of trying it. Okay. And I've just seen the uh, Gail's just hey, come yes. up. Yes, hi, hello, Gail. The, the frame behind Liz is the loft frame, which is set up at eight feet. That's eight feet. So yeah. it's very similar to the studio frame for the bigger machines, uh, which can be set up at eight feet. Yeah. Yes, it's a nice size, that frame. That's, I think that's the one that most of our Moxie customers have gone for, is the eight foot, with some people going to the 10. Um, so, yeah, it's an option. The... The last type of needle that we supply, uh, that we stock at the moment, um, is the leather needle. This is a specific uh, needle point that's designed for going through leather so that it doesn't split. Um, and we got these in because we were going to be doing Academy with all of the um, leather work from Annalise Littlefair. Um, hopefully we'll get an opportunity to run something similar in the future. Um, but if anybody does want to experiment with leather, we have the leather needles. At the moment, we've just got 16s in. Uh, we don't have the 18s. But I can get them. If you're interested, let me know. So, um, what am I talking about next? Yes. So, I wanted to... Now we've talked about needles, which is a great background, because now I can introduce some of the issues. And the issues are... What, are, what we thought was... Those people who've recently got their machine, you know, what are the most common... Things. There aren't a lot of common issues, to be honest, with our handy quilter machines. Um, so it's quite, it was quite a difficult thing to sort of go through. But actually, I thought, well, the things that we can discuss with you is to, even when people have had their machine a while, um, sometimes we find that people don't know. So first of all, my machine will not stitch. That is the statement. My machine won't stitch. Uh, you could say, well, that's a difficult one to answer, but often it's because the needle is in backwards. And there is a, a confusion, a misconception as to what the long groove is. And I'm going to move this up here. I wonder if I can see. I'm just going to fold this over. Hopefully you can see that. So our needle, and this is on our blog post, 
our needle has got a long groove running down the front. Thank you, Pete. It's got a long groove running down the front, and that's where the thread goes. So that's what you've got to remember. It goes lengthways down the length of the needle. At the back, where the hook takes, um, the hook goes past what's called the scarf, and that's what forms the stitch where there's a loop. So that scarf is at the back of the needle. And what happens is that people mistake the scarf for the groove. I, I once had, and I've never had this again because I learnt from it uh, that I was never going to have that conversation again because you can't get that hour back. Um, I once had an hour conversation with somebody who insisted that the long groove was down the front and it was the scarf. And we did everything to get her machine sewing. So the common thing is this, that it will take, you'll be able to pull the thread up, but it won't stitch. So they kind of, you know, you kind of think, okay, well, it's nothing really significantly wrong. The other thing that's come up recently is getting it high enough up into the needle assembly. So you've got a little sight hole on the left. Make sure that the butt of the needle is all the way up. There's no daylight. If you can see daylight, it's not high enough up, not good. So that's very, very important. But the scarf at the back is the key thing. It takes us very little time. And what we will do if somebody phones us up now, because I learned, is... I will ask them to remove the needle. And sometimes the reflection of the thread is causing, you know, a lot of us have got bifocals and stuff and it's not easy to see. I understand that. And also that the reflection of the thread can actually make it look like the groove is at the front and it isn't. So that's very, very important. So that's number one. Number one, needle in backwards. So have a look at the blog uh, post because you'll see pictures of the needle. Number two, I'm getting long stitches on my quilt. Stitch regulation is no longer working, it's broken. Right, this is a really quick conversation. I have, I've had this from all manner of experienced and inexperienced quilters. Anybody can get this wrong. If you go around the back of your machine and you accidentally catch on the encoder cable that goes to the x-axis, side to side, you will find that it can come unplugged on some of the machines. Not all of them. Some of the more recent ones, they're putting in a little retainer, a little cable connector is actually attached to the back. So if you find that your stitching is not working, the first thing you should do is um, stitch away from you to the right, come back and then stitch to the left, do a square. And that will tell you if which encoder is causing the problem. There are technical things you can do on the menus, but that's the best way of telling. And if it isn't stitch regulated, and that can happen in Pro Stitcher too, because um, the Pro Stitcher won't work if the stitch regulator is, in, is unplugged. I've, so I've put on the blog post a whole load of photos of the different encoders and what you're looking for. The other thing is the contact of the rubber wheel is that it's absolutely in contact with either the track or you know the carriage and make sure that that is the case too. So that will be your encoder. So my, stitch, my stitches are no longer stitch regulated for stand up movable machines. Number three, my thread is shredding. My thread is shredding. And we've already talked about that a little bit, but I just wanna say, that in the little pack that we've got and on our infographics on our website, we have got help. Very helpful. Help, help. Common quilting issues. On this sheet, we've got help, my needle broke. And we don't, we won't talk about that at the moment, but we'll talk about the second one. Help, my thread is shredding or breaking. And it lists all the possible reasons that it could be. So if that happens to you, you know, do a little bit of fault determination, but we would rather, if you cannot get it to sew and you are having problems, that after a relatively short time, you just give us a call. Because actually we can probably help you um, more quickly than you just sort of going through some of these and getting frustrated. But for example, incorrect size needle for the thread. That's gonna be a big one in our book. Burr on the needle. One thing you can do, if you've got any burrs, i uh, put it here. If you've got any burrs, say like the little hole that's above the needle, what you can do is get some finish 
cotton thread. This one is a Gutterman 50 weight. And what I do is I just get a length of that and I just run it through all the different thread guides, seesaw, and just see if it shreds. And if it shreds, then you know you've got a burr. Yes, that can affect the um, encoder as well, Jane, if your cat chews through the encoder cable. Oh, yeah, that's a common one. That's a common one. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What happened to the cat? Have you still got the cat? <laughs> of course you've still got the cat. I think we sent a new encoder cable. Problem sorted. Absolutely brilliant. Which Jane was that? Another question from Joyce in the States, which I've just answered in text form, but it might be worth talking about. She's saying that um, some people say the needle should be at the 5.30 position instead of the 6 o'clock position. If that's the case, it just sh it means that your timing on your machine is not absolutely perfectly set. You'll still be able to use the machine, but if you find it works better at 5.30, put it at 5.30. But if the timing is absolutely perfectly set, it will work better at the 6 o'clock position. Yeah, and the next time you get it serviced, mention to your tech that, or your service engineer that that's, that's what's happening. It's also always very useful to be forewarned. Um, to be honest, 99% of the time, we, we do, I mean, you do it, don't you, Pete? You retime quite often. You'll retime, yeah. I mean, we like to clean out everything and clean up the hook area and stuff. So we tend to retime the machines anyway, even if they're sewing beautifully when we get them. Yeah. Um, Very good point from Linda as well. Oh if yeah. You, if you keep the um, keep the needle at 5.30 all the time, oh, yes. then your needle will potentially be striking your hook much more strongly than it should, and it will wear the hook out. And the hook is an expensive component. It um, is. To replace, it's about 300 pounds for the part alone from memory in the UK, so it'll be similar $300 in the States. And it's much cheaper, therefore, to get your needle in the right place, which is very Yeah, definitely, thing. definitely. I mean, the, the, hook, the hook thing is, I mean, if you will hear it. You will hear it strike the hook, won't you, Pete? I mean, that's, that's one thing that we notice if someone's timing is out. The first thing we hear is the hook and the needle coming into contact. So, yeah, if you're adjusting it and adjusting that needle position, um, it's something that we, we could say to somebody if they're a long distance away from us as a temporary fix, but we wouldn't recommend it for a long-term solution. Thank you, Linda, for that input. That was really useful. Okay, so next one is, so shredding. I think, um, excuse me, instead of doing this, got to get rid of the, the there's an irritating fly. Um, anything else on that? No, I think I've covered all those things. And like I say, if, you're, if you've got some, some thread, that's um, cotton thread that will chafe nicely. That's a good test. And the one above your, where the needle goes in, just above the, the needle uh, itself, that little last guide, um, if there's any kind of wear on there or you've caught it perhaps with your scissors or something like that, then you, know, you could have created a little burr. And we don't like burrs. Where to oil? Right, Pete, I think we need to move. I'm gonna move now to the uh, Capri and I'm going to talk about stuff over here. So here we've got the lovely Capri <clears throat> and the Capri has got an insert between these two side pieces. The insight table eyes, magic eyes, are uh, either side of the needle plate. And this bit here, and the reason I thought this would be the machine to talk about oiling, is it's got little, um, little things that you can undo so that we can easily get access. You can actually see much easier what is happening with the hook. And where your bobbin case goes in. So for those people who've got the old style Sweet 16 tables, you, you'd find this really nice. So every bobbin change, you'll get your uh, little brush and you'll clean out. And I'm just looking here. Yeah, there is a bit of gubbins, but I haven't got my brush with me. <clears throat> and this is where now, can you see this? Do you need another light, Pete? It's okay, it's just a question of adjusting the tripod at the same time. So I can get a little lower on here. Sorry about this, everyone. Right. Can't get low enough. Give me a sec. 
quick release tripod isn't quick release when you actually need it to be. Do you want me to do that? Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> We're just looking at the floor here at the moment. Right. Okay. Oh, I see. Could have taken that off. Yeah, that's never so straightforward. Right. Nearly there. So this this section that comes forward is so that you can actually see Ooh, for cleaning. Finally. Hey. Right. So. And everybody cheered. This is where. We would put okay, the oil. Let me, look. let me just get right in there. So this is the nose of the machine here. That's okay. good, yeah. So that's the hook assembly. And Liz has got the point of the oil spout here. Let me just make sure it's focused. Yeah. There we go. There you go. There's a little bit of oil there. That's where your oil. Oh, just that. I just jotted it there. And that's now too much. I would just get a tissue and just wipe away a little bit of that so excess. One drop of oil there. I hope that everybody could see that. It's actually really difficult to show it, isn't it? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Diana said that she takes the needle plate off so you can see for cleaning and oiling. Yeah, that's a good thing to yeah, do. Yeah, I think it's a good thing to do. From time to time, certainly. Something we've covered before. Yeah. So now I'm going to put that in there. And as I say, it's quite, it's good having this go forward. And then that just slides back. And then there's a couple of knobs underneath just to keep that in place. Okay, so the the other thing I was going to cover today, and that's with the um, oiler that comes with the machines, by the way, and that will last you forever. And don't worry if it goes a funny colour. <clears throat> the glide thread has been really, really popular, popular, and it comes in both 60 and 40 weight. So most people are familiar with the 40 weight. That's what's been used on this um, sample piece for doing one of the jade uh, wreath rulers. And then Abigail did this. This was nice. Just using the, um, the grid template in one of Cindy's sets, Cindy Needham's sets. So I've put on a 60 weight thread and I'm just going to do a little bit up here just to make sure that this is okay. Um, I've put a cream thread in the back in the bobbin and I've got 11 stitches print I'm going to go down to 10 and I'm going to pick that thread up. Linda thank you for answering that question about the pro stitcher and thread breaking. All the pro stitcher does is moving the machine so it's something else it's not the pro stitcher that causes your thread to break. So I'm just gonna just gonna do some free motion quilting just to check that this is working okay. So this is so what I would do is I'd always do a test piece on something very similar to what I want to use. And I can see that some of the thread is coming up. So it's a little bit too tight on the top. So I'm just adjusting. We've got tension of three, it was 360. I'm just going to loosen it off 350 and just see what that looks like. I'm just going to reduce the stitches per minute on cruise on my Capri. So let's go all the way over here. Let's see what that looks like. Okay. Right. So that that looks good. So this this weight of thread here, you can see is quite different, gives a much finer look to the quilting than this. This is very defined, the same colour. So this is the 40 weight? Here. Yeah. So this, we're nearly out of it. And this is 60 weight. Yeah. It's difficult to tell sometimes on the camera, but in real life it is very much finer on the 60 weight. So those are the two threads next to one another. Yeah. This is the this is the grey glide 60. Let me just move that way. This is quite fine. And then we've got the cream. It's actually quite useful to see. This is linen, isn't it? 
we'd put this next to each other. So linen, very popular color. You could piece with this. It's a bit like if you've used bottom line in the past, it's a bit like bottom line, but that's linen in 60 weight and 40 weight. And to show you the effect of that, I have got my sample here. So on the large glide spools, and the 60 weight only comes in a 5,000 meter cone. The cone is a black color, indicating 60 weight. And the 40 weight ones are on gray cones. Yeah. So here we've got, this is the bits on this that were done with linen color. The center, all these feathers were done with the 60 weight. And these, this ruler work was done by going out and back with the 40 weight. So this, some of this is double line, some of it is single line, but even the single line you can see, even though it's the same color, we've got much finer look, which is what I wanted for the feathers. And if you, you know, you can see the impact of that. Uh, it's very effective on this particular design. Yes, so as Linda has said, the needle size is based on your top thread size because it's only the top thread that goes through the needle eye. Yeah, so if you look at the charts for 60 weight thread, then you can see that 60 weight appears in quite a few places. So you kind of do need to try it, but I've actually put a 14 needle in this. Um, because I wanted to, you know, have the smallest hole possible. It's a single piece of fabric, it's not pieced. But as I was saying earlier, if you've got something like um, a pieced or foundation pieced with multiple seams, I would go to a 16 and it's still possible to do the 60 weight with a size 16 needle. So you would use the 60 weight if you just wanted a finer yeah. effect on the top thread or in fact you can Something use like the this. 60 weight in the bottom as well. This isn't this isn't 60 weight. This is 40 weight and it looks a bit heavy. So I would I would use the um, it's a good example of where if I changed like on this as well. I think that's with 40 and it's it's just too heavy. It would have been better and would have looked just as effective, but it would have been easier to do the scribble with um, that's the back, with the 60 weight rather than the 40 weight, but I, I just didn't change it. So this is 40 weight, very, very defined look. Okay, so that is about 60 weight and 40 weight glide. We'll be putting some more samples of, of the 60 weight and 40 weight uh, glide up because I've got a thing to quilt over there, so that's great. Um, the, and these were 40 weight. So quite, again, quite defined. <clears throat> it's quite a strong contrast, you know, and when there's no room for error when you're doing black with white. So the other thing is thread combinations, and that's what I was going to talk finally um, about. King Tut, for example. King Tut can work very well with something like bottom line on the bobbin. And bottom line can come either with a pre-wound uh, with the paper sides. And I thought I had one, but I must be in a different box. Here it is. There's a bottom line. That's a pre-wound bottom line called Super Bob. If we were doing Glide 40 on the top, we could do glide 60 on the bottom. And if you were doing uh, glide 40 on the top, you could also use one of the Magnus. That one is the Magnus Soft, which is a lovely combination because this has got a little bit of fluffiness to it, which works really well with a very much slicker thread like the glide. And it's a really nice combination, a little bit more of a duller impact than the glide thread. So that's again, a very nice combination. And those combinations are the ones that we, we normally talk about on the foundation workshop. So to wrap up, I just want to tell you about some fantastic special offers, which we mentioned in our preamble. And the first one is that we love glide thread. I think most people have kind of picked that up now. 
We absolutely love Glide Thread. It has a fabulous range of colors. Pete and I spent a lovely few days putting together some combinations of nine cones of a thousand meter spools of Glide and putting them in sets. So they're kind of themed or they're like the most popular backgrounds and stuff like that. And Pete, it's very kindly brought over. questions here. Yeah. Somebody says that using the Pro Stitcher system, they generally use a size 18 needle, whereas they only use a 16 for free motion. I haven't heard that one before. Okay. And can you use standard super bobs on the long arm? No, you No, no not the L's. You, you can get super bobs, Leanne, but they have to be the M class ones for the long arm. Yeah, it's this side, Leanne. And Sally, no, it doesn't matter which, uh, which of the thread holders you use, you can use either of them, irrespective of which way the thread comes off the spool. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Dark Classics. This is, in our, this is our Glide Thread Club collection number 11. That's Dark Classics. We've got ones like this, which is uh, Heavy Metal. That's a really lovely collection of your greys. I'm not going to go through all of these, but just to show you that we've got all of these, like Christmas, the recent one we did was Valentine, then we've got Sea and Sky. Beautiful. These are all on our blog. They're on our website to order. If you order three packs of these, you will get a free handy quilter purple mat. Um, this is a little cutting mat, very handy to have either on the back table if you've got one on your machine or by the side of you to trim any loose threads. Um, particularly useful when you're piecing and things, of course, to have by your domestic machine. So it's good for anybody. Um, so glide thread is as good, just as good. We have a lot of questions about this. And I should have said it really earlier. It's great on domestic machines. Um, if anybody's been watching the Midnight Quilter, Angela Walters, she uses glide thread all the time and she's demoing on a, a handy quilter domestic machine. And the other thing that we've got, apart from the free rotary cutting mat, is if you order over a hundred pounds in the next Next week, isn't it? Next week. In the next week, you will get a free handy quilter bag in the latest color. We are modeling color orange, tangerine, or something like that. It's appropriate for this season. Handy quilter bag. So over a hundred pounds on your order will automatically include it. And if you would like to order three Glide Thread Club bags, you're gonna get that free worth, gosh, I don't know how much it's worth, but you know, these rotary mats are not cheap. This is a lovely one. It's in purple. It's got handy quilter on it. What's not to like? So that's everything for me uh, today. I hope that's been of interest to you. I wanted to cover a few different things. I wanted to cover a little bit on the threads and the needles so that we've got that sort of technical information for you, for those who are both more experienced and who are new to long arming. So listen, it's been a pleasure as always to see so many familiar names coming up on our Facebook feed. Um, it's a real highlight of our week and we look forward to seeing you here in person, hopefully sometime this year. And if we don't, we'll see you virtually online next week on Handy Quilter, on our Handy Quilter uh, Facebook Live at 11 a.m. next Saturday. We look forward to seeing you then. You take care. Bye now. <laughs>